Thanks, Nick, and thank everybody uh, for coming out here uh, to, uh, to talk to us. And that was a great uh, opening session and a great speech by Robin last night, which I think covers, uh, it helps to frame some of the comments that I would like to make, uh, make this morning. Um, you know, it's easy to forget, I think, after the last two years of this unbelievable, exhausting, dizzying roller coaster that Egyptian politics has become, what it felt like on January 25th of 2011. Uh, I mean, this was really one of those days that turns the experience of an academic field, of a generation of scholars, activists, citizens, journalists, policymakers, turns it completely on its head. And you know, the 18 days between January 25th and when Hosni Mubarak finally disappeared from the stage on February 11th were really one of the most riveting moments, I think, in my long, uh, not as long as some of my friends, but um, uh, I'll, I'm happy to say, um, uh, in, in my experience of working in the region. I've been going to Egypt, uh, the first time I went was in 1991, and uh, to see what happened on January 25th is something which we don't want to lose sight of uh, as I go through the litany of, of problems and issues that I'll be talking about for the next 30 minutes. Um, and one thing which is very important to remember is that I think that what we saw in Tahrir Square, we being Americans watching on TV, um, I think this might have been the first time in a decade that Americans writ large were able to see Arabs, Egyptians, Muslims, in a way that they could identify with. I mean, as you all know, we went through a decade of war, terrorism, uh, images, relentless images of extremism, violence, uh, everything from Afghanistan to Iraq to the war on terror. And I think that those days in that after January 25th, where we could see these attractive young people that Robin was talking about so eloquently, we could see them yearning for the same things that we yearn for, acting the ways that we act, and identifying with their struggle for freedom. I think for many Americans, this was something which was in a very eye-opening in its own way. And I think it's very important that we don't lose that, uh, that sense of possible identification um, as we move forward and try and think through what, um, what the changes in Egypt mean, not only for Egypt, uh, but for ourselves. Now, um, as I said, there is uh, a truly unbelievable roller coaster which follows what the, the, the departure of Hosni Mubarak on February 11th, 2011. My colleague at George Washington University, uh, Nathan Brown, um, I think he, he got this exactly right when he called this uh, the stupidest transition in history. Uh, it, it honestly feels that at every possible moment when a political actor in Egypt could make a decision, and I exclude nobody, um, when they can make a decision, they make the wrong one. They boycott elections that they should participate in. They dissolve parliaments they shouldn't have dissolved. They form coalitions they shouldn't have formed. They pass laws they shouldn't have passed. They open fire on crowds when they shouldn't have. Almost everything that could go wrong has gone wrong in Egyptian transition. And yet, like Marwan and like uh, Robin, I remain broadly optimistic about Egypt. And I'll explain why as I come to the end, why I think that it's interesting and important that Egypt, Egypt has muddled through everything I'm about to describe and has gotten to the place where it, where it is now and where it might eventually arrive. Now, I think the first thing that we have to remember as we try and make sense of that is that January 25th did not come from nowhere. Um, I think there's a common myth about the Arab awakening and about uh, the, the Arab uprisings that this was something like Eastern Europe in 1989, where you had countries, societies that were entirely frozen, where there was no dissent, no freedom, no opportunity to speak or to protest, and that Egypt, for example, there's an idea that until that revolution, uh, people were living sullenly in fear, and nobody knew that there was so much discontent and so much uh, uh, unhappiness. And this is just absolutely wrong. And I think that it, what the truth about Egypt is far more interesting than that. I would actually say that January 25th in Egypt was the culmination of at least a decade of rising mobilization and rising transformation of society, which was extremely interesting and important and helps to explain how you get what you get in Egypt. I mean, it would be a nice story if people who, were, who had long been sullen suddenly discover their freedom. But the real story is more interesting. 
I would say that to understand January 25th, you have to go back a decade and you have to look at, um, in, 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 the, in the 25 minutes I have, I'm not going to give you the entire decade, don't worry. Um, but I simply want to say that if you go back and you look at protest movements, which began in a very small way in 2001, 2002, many of them directed against uh, Israel's war with the Palestinians and then against our occupation of Iraq, you saw the kernel of a protest movement, which began to appear. Early protests were tolerated by the government because the government didn't mind if you protested against foreign things, right? That didn't threaten the regime. And this was a time-honored way for them to let people let off steam, you know, let people protest against Israel or against America. It didn't threaten or challenge anything. But in 2003, 2004, a group of activists started coming together and they said, this isn't enough for us. We want to turn inward. And there was a movement called the Kafaya movement. It means enough. And basically, this was a small number of journalists, uh, young activists, bloggers, university professors, a pretty small group of people. I don't think at its peak it numbered more than a few thousand. Um, but what they did was to very self-consciously use new media technologies and use temporary small political openings to get their message out and to punch way above their weight and to challenge all of the red lines which kept people confined into these small zones of political critique. And so what they would do were things like protest against the succession of Hosni Mubarak's son as president, which they and virtually all other Egyptians saw as absolutely unacceptable, anathema to the notion that this was a presidential republic and not a monarchy, that the idea that you could pass it on to your son they seized on this as a symbol of what was wrong with Egyptian politics, and they would go out on the streets. And, and, and these, were, these were wonderful days for people who are interested in activism, because you would get 50 people who would suddenly show up via a flash mob, uh, you know, an SMS message. They would show up on a street corner, and they would hold up these signs. And if the same thing had happened five years ago, they would have been 50 nuts holding up signs on a street corner who would quickly have been arrested. Nobody would even have known that it ever happened, right? Because they would have been hauled off into the dungeons and disappeared. But instead, they would make sure that the Al Jazeera camera, the, the Arab TV cameraman was there to film it. They would take pictures and immediately upload them to their blogs. And then all of the Western journalists were watching, were reading these blogs and watching Al Jazeera. And all of a sudden, they were punching way above their weight. And Kafaya was an explicitly uh, cross-ideological coalition. You had young members of the Muslim Brotherhood were parts of it. You had leftists, pretty hard, extreme socialists, leftists, communists. You had old Nasserists, Arab nationalists, liberals. This was a very kind of cross-sectional group. They weren't a mass movement in any way, but they laid the foundations for a spirit of activism, a culture of activism. Over the next six years, you get this whole kind of, I would say, cascading wave of protests. You have, many of you have probably heard of the April 6th movement, which was started as a Facebook group in solidarity with a massive labor strike in the town, uh, this kind of grim industrial town where there was a big labor action. Um, there were protests by, by judges, by journalists, by almost every sector of society was involved in protest over the span of the 2000s. By some counts, uh, Joel Bainan at Stanford Stanford University to count once, and he counted something like 100,000 different uh, wildcat labor strikes and protests in the decade of the 2000s. And so all of this is a way of saying that there was a lot going on in Egypt. It wasn't an awakening in the sense of there was nothing and then there was something. But January 25th was different, because what happened on January 25th was that for the first time, all of those different groups were able to come together in a united front. And they were able to get the ordinary people out to join them. And one of the common myths about January 25th is that they caught Hosni Mubarak by surprise. They didn't. In fact, on January 25th, the, the pathways to Tahrir were guarded by ranks of security forces 10 deep. And if there had only been 10,000 protesters like normal, they would have been defeated easily. But instead, you get hundreds of thousands of people showing up. And over the space of three days, they defeat the police in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They seize Tahrir Square, and they hold it. And it's not just Tahrir. In Alexandria, you get suddenly hundreds of thousands of people swarming downhill towards the Corniche. They end up burning down every police station in Tahrir and essentially taking control of the city in a period of three days. This was 
the activists connecting with the masses. Why were they able to do it? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm only supposed to talk about Egypt, but I think that Tunisia is the reason. I think they've been watching what happened in Tunisia. They suddenly believed that victory was possible. They were inspired by this. And they came out together in that moment of enthusiasm. And they were able to do what, and let's be really honest about this, nobody thought was possible. The activists who went out and were planning the January 25th protest did not expect to win. They had been doing this for six years. They always lost. Winning was you know, almost unimaginable. But when Ben Ali fell, Everybody suddenly thought, you know what? We might do this. It's worth taking the risk of being beaten up, imprisoned, tortured, jailed, because we might actually win. And that expectation, that possibility, was inspirational, powerful, and it tipped the balance. It was a moment of unity, a moment of enthusiasm, which unfortunately, as you heard uh, from Marwan and from Robin, is long since passed. And it's given way to a long process of polarization, division, fragmentation, institutional collapse, and an extraordinarily poorly managed transition. Um, what I'm, because, uh, because Robin did it, and Robin gave you 10 points, I, I figured I should give you 10 points as well. Uh, 10's a nice round number, and we can go like two minutes each. Um, so I'll do that. But I do want to, before I get into that, I just want to highlight a couple of things that I think are important for us all to keep in mind. And one is simple analytical humility. Nobody predicted January 25th would work, including the activists who planned it. And we should take that to heart. Everybody. Everybody, everybody believed that Gamal Mubarak had managed to wire his way into power. When you talk to leaders of the National Democratic Party in Egypt in November of 2010, after an incredibly um, uh, gerrymandered and stage managed election, they were riding high. They were as cocky as the Jordanian palace is right now, um, believing that they, had done, that they were totally in control. And it's not just them. I would say that at this time a year ago, if you had asked any uh, kind of savvy Egyptian liberal activist, academic, they would have told you that the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces had Egypt totally under control. They were pulling the strings. They had managed everything. And that they had consolidated, consolidated their position. And that we had basically had a military, you know, the military had defeated. They, they shed Hosni Mubarak and then seized control. And then like a, a month later, uh, the entire leadership of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces was summarily fired. And they have moved back into a subordinate position with their fundamental interests protected, but they're not ruling anymore. Again, humility. These things have taken the very best of us by surprise. So with that, you know, you don't listen to anything I'm about to say. <laughs> but here's 10 points that I want to lay out for you to think about as you try and make sense of what's happening in Egypt. The first is that the mobilization that we're seeing in the streets is not going to go away. That this is a persistent structural reality in Egyptian politics right now. The reason that I began by trying to point you back before January 25th is to say that the reason you have people out in the streets now, the reason that you have so much challenging going on is that this is rooted in these fundamental realities of how, how social media and new information technology allows people to come together, organize, and protest, but also how the absence of formal institutional channels to participate in politics leaves people little other choice if they want to make an impact. If you don't have a parliament that you can you know, channel your grievances through, and you don't have an effective civil society that can press its demands on a responsive government, what other choice do you have than to go into the streets? So people have the reason to protest, and they have the means to protest. Now, one, I think, very real risk of January 25th, uh, of, of, the, of the experience of January 25th and the revolution is, I think, a tendency to glorify uh, this mobilization and to see protest as necessarily a good thing. And I would say that, the, that it actually goes in both directions. At one level, this mobilization is an undeniable, unbelievably powerful positive. Uh, I remember I was talking to a senior leader of the SCAF uh, back in January, uh, back in like the summer of 2011, and people were asking him, you know, Are, do do you really think it's wise to let the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, compete in elections? You know, what happens if they win? And he just laughed and he said, you know, we've been doing this now for six months, and let me tell you, if they if the Muslim Brotherhood tries to impose itself, the people still know their way to Tahrir Square. 
They're not letting us do anything, and they're going to do the same thing to the Brotherhood. In other words, it's a check on untrammeled executive power. And in a place where there are few other checks, that's important. The other thing is that protest movements have been extremely good at highlighting various kinds of abuses, human rights abuses, rape, torture. Uh, the un, uh, I think one of the biggest issues in Egypt right now is the fact that the security sector is completely unreformed and people are still being hauled off the streets, tortured, uh, abused, and there's a complete absence of accountability. And the protesters have been extremely good at documenting that communicating it to the outside world, and trying to put pressure on, uh, on everybody to try and make it stop. So that's all good. But the downside of it is that it helps to contribute to Egypt being ungovernable and to the constant, persistent, unending problems where politics is consumed by the, day, by the weekly rhythm of crowds coming out into the streets and protesting. And sometimes it turns violent, sometimes it doesn't. But in a sense, it makes it very difficult for anybody to get anything done in Egypt. It's contributing to the paralysis and institutional breakdown, which is one of the major issues I'll come to in a moment. It also, um, I think unfortunately, can become an alternative or a substitute for competing in elections which you're not going to win. So uh, I'll mention this in a minute, but we have significant portions of what many of us would consider to be the liberal uh, sectors of Egypt who basically have announced once again, uh, Mohamed al-Berdai just announced this uh, this morning, that uh, he's going to boycott uh, the uh, parliamentary election scheduled in April. And again, you know, elections are hard work. It's difficult. You have to go out there and campaign, build organizations uh, and all that. And sometimes I think it's a little bit easier and ex more exciting to go out there and you know, fight the tear gas and be out in the streets. So I think protest is both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, but it's also inevitable and it's not going away. So that's point number one. We are not, don't expect, I mean, I don't care if, if Egypt becomes a fully institutionalized democracy, you're still going to see people going to Tahrir and protesting five, 10 years from now, because I think this is deeply rooted in what Egypt and the Arab world is today. Number two, uh, the Islamists. And Robin talked about this quite a bit, as did Marwan. Um, but I think that the rise of the Islamists electorally, socially, and politically in Egypt is one of the things that most worries people about what's happened since January 25th. I mean, every one of you, I'm sure, has read countless uh, op-eds and, and stories which all take the same basic form. We were fooled by the attractive English-speaking Facebook kids of January 25th, and in reality, all it did was remove Mubarak and pave the way to an Islamist radical takeover. This is the general narrative that we now have. There's elements of truth to it, and there's lots of elements of untruth to it. I would say that very few people were or should have been surprised to see the Muslim Brotherhood do well in elections. Um, they were and always had been the most organized, uh, best resourced, and most politically savvy movement in Egypt. And when you have a foundational election, as you had in Egypt, uh, they had they had you know, early mover organizational advantages. They also, uh, again, let's just not say that they were like, you know, this was a gift from God. They worked really hard on this. So while, while liberal groups and secular groups were going to Tahrir and protesting, they were out there organizing street by street, house by house, neighborhood by neighborhood, delivering food baskets, doing social services, uh, you know, doing campaigning. And so they both had an, orga an organizational advantage and they worked that advantage. Um, and so their performance in the elections, uh, the parliamentary elections where they won 47% of the seats, shouldn't have surprised anybody. People were more surprised by the success of the Sadafis, as Robin talked about. I'll get to them in a minute. But I want to stick with the Brotherhood, because there's an idea. There's actually two conflicting ideas right now about what's happening in Egypt. One is that the Muslim Brotherhood is this unstoppable, monolithic evil force taking over, controlling everything. And there's some evidence for that. You know, as they've, as they've seized state institutions and no political force is organized against them. But the other is that they're incompetent. That they have governed, at, as they have governed, they have been revealed as unable to effectively manage the country. And as Marwan discussed, under Muslim Brotherhood rule, you've had the near complete collapse of governance in the country one of the worst economic crises in the history of the country. 
Um, almost no legislation of any kind being passed, implemented, or, or, or executed. And almost this mocking sense of them that as the Egyptian pound is at its lowest level in history, what are the Muslim Brotherhood MP or former MPs talking about, or the members of the Shura Council? They're talking about you know, you know, the great achievement of allowing policemen to have beards. I mean, seriously, who cares? The pound is collapsing, and Egypt's about to go bankrupt, and you're focusing on YouTube videos and, and, um, and, and whether policemen can have beards. And again, the idea here then is that the Muslim Brotherhood is, has done well in politics and done well electorally, but there is, and this is what democracy is supposed to do, right? There is a, a self-regulating nature to it. In power, they are being exposed. They are not the evil masterminds, geniuses that we thought they were. They've been unable to do the things that we thought they were going to be able to do. When I used to talk to Muslim Brotherhood leaders in Egypt in, uh, you know, before the first elections, I was actually more worried because they would sit and they would give me these detailed plans they had for being pragmatic, attracting foreign direct investment, getting the ships running on time. Uh, they had a shadow government ready to go. And you looked at them and you said, wow. These guys really have it together. And when they win the elections, they're going to have a president who's going to make the ships run on time. It's going to be popular. And it's going to set the stage for Islamist political domination for a generation. That has not happened. <laughs> If you look at Egypt right now, you see the opposite of that. You see them using their early advantages to seize power and then alienating everybody, mismanaging everything. And um, here's the thing which is really interesting now to kind of put these two, last two points together. One of the great fears about Islamists in elections was always the one man, one vote, one time. Right? That they would let themselves be voted into office, and then once in office, they would abolish democracy and, uh, and simply rule as tyrants. It's very interesting that right now, it's the Muslim Brotherhood that's pushing for elections. And it's the liberals who are arguing for a boycott. One man, one vote, one time is a myth which has been pretty thoroughly demolished, I would say, by uh, what we've seen the Islamists doing in power. They haven't done much good in power, but that's one myth that I think we can put to rest. OK, point, oh, point number three about uh, the, the liberal opposition or the secular opposition or whatever you want to call it. I would say that that is exactly the problem, that we cannot put a clear name on the opposition. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis have all of their problems, all of their issues. They fight with each other. They compete with each other. Sometimes they form a block. Sometimes they don't. But compared to their opponents, they seem like a smoothly functioning machine. Um, I think that it's difficult to overstate how frustrated many people are by the performance of the opposition to the Islamists in Egypt and their inability to form a unified political movement an organized political list, or to put forward any kind of coherent political alternative. Um, and uh, if you look at the presidential election, I think this captures the, the best what, uh, what I think I'm talking about. In the first round of the presidential election, Mohamed al-Morsi, now president, won 25% of the vote. I think that is a fair approximation of the Brotherhood's natural real constituency in Egypt, about 25% of the vote. And Ahmed Shafiq, who was Mubarak's last prime minister and a symbol of the old regime, won 25%. And I think that that captured, at that time, a real sense of the old elite, people who were extremely worried about the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Christians, uh, the old business elite. That, I think, also was a real number. But that leaves 50% of the vote unaccounted for. If the non-Islamist non-old regime had simply been able to agree on one candidate, say, Amr Musa, you are going to be the candidate of the center, there's a very good chance that he would have won without a runoff, with over 50% of the vote. And God would be better off <laughs> than we are right now. But they couldn't. Instead, they fielded three candidates who split that 50% uh, of the vote three ways, political malpractice of the highest order. One would think that they would have learned their lesson from this and said, OK, we're going to come together and form something better. But it hasn't happened. They disagree. They bicker. They have personality disagreements, political disagreements, strategic differences, real programmatic differences. The Free Egyptians are essentially a capitalist, free market, neoliberal party. 
and many of the shock troops of the street protesters are hardcore leftist socialists. Hamdin Sabahi is a populist with socialist economic leanings, and uh, you know the, some of the others in the in the um, in the in the Egyptian uh, kind of the the National Salvation Front are not. And so basically, what you have then is the Brotherhood benefiting from the political division and fragmentation of their opponents. I think Marwan's point before about how this will settle itself down over time is right. I think that over time you'll see them overcoming those differences, but it's going to take some time, and it's impossible to overstate how frustrated many of us are by how slow the process has been towards the, con the convergence of an effective um, party um, to, to face off against, uh, against the Muslim Brotherhood and the others. The fourth point is that this environment that I've just been describing has been extremely ser served extremely poorly by the uh, almost unbelievable institutional flux and uncertainty that has characterized Egyptian politics. Um, one of the favorite uh, essays that I, of my own that I published uh, maybe ever was a really short one that it took me like 20, like 20 minutes to write because it came to me in the shower. And it, it used uh, how, uh, Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes. Remember the cartoon Calvin and Hobbes? You all remember Calvin Ball? Where, uh, where Calvin and Hobbes, the little boy and his tiger, they play this game with each other. Calvin Ball, the only rule is there is no rule. There are no rules. You make it up as you go along. You know, so it's like, well, I'm, I'm running with the football and I'm about to score 70, 30 million points, except that, oh no, now the goal is in the tree. <laughs> oh, I'll start climbing the tree. It's like, oh, but if you're holding the ball, then you have to get hit with a water balloon. You know, in other words, it makes no sense. You can't plan. There's no way to have a strategy when you have no rules. That's been Egyptian politics. It's been unbelievable how this has unfolded. The absence of a constitution, and then the election of a parliament, and then the dissolution of the parliament over the course of, uh, over the course of a couple of months. Uh, the, you know, the constantly shifting rules about, uh, about electoral districts, about electoral design, about, what, about the powers. For up until this extremely controversial and quite poor constitution was finally rammed through by President Morsi uh, a couple months ago, up until that point, there was actually nothing which defined the powers of the presidency, the powers of the parliament, anybody's powers. And again, in an atmosphere of economic collapse, political fragmentation, and deep uncertainty about the future, this institutional uncertainty made things a thousand times worse. And then that led, number five, to a deep polarization. And one of the most worrying things about Egypt, and, I, and Marwan alluded to this, uh, and Robin alluded to it, is the extent over the last six months, I would say, maybe a little bit longer, of this deep and really unprecedented polarization between Islamists and their adversaries in every aspect of Egyptian society, not just politics, but even on the street. We're seeing things now that we never saw before. People attacking each other on the street, these kind of anomic, anarchic, violent clashes, um, this naked, brutal culture war taking place at every level, and this polarization is fed by many of the same things, and this is point number six, that we celebrated at the time of the revolution. The media, social media, and this turbocharged public sphere which sends every rumor, no matter how unconfirmed, into hyperspace. You know, so just a, a couple weeks ago, there was a story that uh, some uh, Islamists had come and sacked uh, a church uh, outside of Alexandria. Well, it turns out it never even happened. I mean, it literally just didn't happen. But once it was on social media, it became a fact overnight. It led to clashes, these intense uh, exchanges. And that's just one of a million examples. The polarization is intense and extreme and taking new forms that are deeply worrying to everybody. It's made worse by point number seven, which is the economic collapse that Marwan was talking about, and just the, the mind-boggling nature of the complete collapse of the Egyptian economy. The tourism sector has been devastated. If it was bad before, the armed men who stormed one of the premier luxury hotels in central Cairo and ransacked the lobby pretty much put an end to anything that might have been left. And that's a major source of foreign, yeah, I mean, I send my students to study there and it scares me now. And it never used to scare me. Add on to that, you know, gang rapes that are taking place in Tahrir Square where women are being singled out uh, for what can only be described as public mass rapes. And it creates an entirely um, 
uh, I would say, an extraordinarily raw sense of what Egypt is now and where it's going. Um, but I'm not, I won't dwell on that. I'll simply say, because I, I see that I have 18 seconds left, that, um, that uh, the other points I was going to make were about kind of what it means to be democratic in Egypt right now. Um, and I think that one of the biggest problems we have is that the Muslim Brotherhood believes that they are the Democrats because they are winning elections. But they're governing in a majoritarian style which does not tolerate or make allowance for the legitimate rights of others. And that's at the core politically, I think. And again, I'm echoing what Marwan said, is that they are being democratic, far more democratic than anyone else in Egypt but they're not behaving in what we would consider a democratic way, inclusive, pluralist, respectful of fundamental rights. And I think all of these things then come together into this deep political um, malaise which has uh, kind of taken over from those early revolutionary days. So since I'm out of time, uh, I'll stop. But um, <laughs> hopefully someone will ask about what America can do about this, because I'm sure <laughs> Nick. Okay, so Mark, <laughs> what should America do about this? It's we funny you should ask. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, so one of the things which then, when, when you start looking at it, and you've alluded to this several times now in your opening remarks, is I think there's a popular notion in the United States, you know, the debate, who lost Egypt, yeah. right? And one of the things I was trying to get at is that America didn't cause the revolution and it couldn't have stopped it if it had wanted to. I mean, people forget that in those 18 days, it's not just that you had 100,000 people in Tahrir Square. You had basically every city in the country had, you know, the people had taken over and destroyed state authority. Obama saying, everybody go home. Uh, you know, we're going to, Omar Suleiman's going to rule the country now. This wasn't going to work. And so I think that actually Obama did a really good job of helping to smooth the passage to Mubarak leaving. And then I think better than any previous administration, I think he was willing to let democracy work. In other words, if the Islamists win in previous administrations, I think we would have seen kind of the rug being pulled back, like you saw after Hamas won the Palestinian elections in 2006. And he's been willing to give them that rope. I think that where we are right now is, in a sense, we're starting to see a, a swing backward, which we need to see, which is that Obama's right that we cannot micromanage Egyptian politics. I thought Marwan was right that we can't pick winners, and we can't you know, kind of go out there and say, well, we think that this person should be president, this party should win. It doesn't work that way. But I do think that what we need to be doing now is being more vocal about not just supporting the process, which we're good at, but also supporting our values. So we've been very good on, at saying, stick to elections, respect the democratic process. We haven't been as good at saying, we think that what you're doing uh, to alienate Christians is dangerous. We don't think you're doing enough to protect human rights or fundamental freedoms. And I think that where we are, I think we, we saw an important course correction in our being willing to step back and let Egyptians work out their own issues, which has to be done. Now I think we need to do a little bit more about saying, we're not dictating to you, but, you know, we actually do have some things that matter to us, and those include women's rights, the rights of minorities, freedom, and the like. The single biggest pro issue that we're face gonna face in Washington coming up then, just to answer, finish answering the question, is that many people believe that our primary sources of leverage are not our rhetoric, but our aid. And we have some real problems here. There's two kinds of aid that we get, well, three kinds of aid that we give. The first is to kind of democracy promotion to civil society organizations, and that's totally, out, that's totally off the table now. I mean, basically, since they arrested the NDI workers, we can't fund, and uh, we have not figured out a way to fund civil society groups. There's military aid. Many people like to, like, uh, want us to use our military aid, and two problems with that. The first is that most of that aid actually goes to um, American factories in uh, political swing districts like Ohio, and so if we cut the aid, we're actually hurting ourselves. But the other is that since the, since the SCAF stepped back from politics, leverage on them doesn't have the same weight that it used to have. And then the third is we have economic assistance. And so, for example, we could push the IMF to withhold its loan and that sort of thing. But then you're playing with fire, right? Because if they don't get that economic assistance, you'd see the whole, country, the whole economy collapsing. Right. So it's a real dilemma. 
It is, and having served in government, and, and I served in Egypt as well, this mm -hmm. is a very, very difficult balance for any American president to get right. We're the natural outside leader, and the Arabs expect us to be involved, and yet President Obama, I think you're right, has skillfully pulled back a little bit and said, this is not about us, we should let the Arabs, in this case the Egyptians, dictate what happens, we'll intervene when we can. I thought Hillary Clinton was able to establish a relationship with Mohamed Morsi to help achieve the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in November. We have a very close military-to-military -military relationship. It goes back decades between our military and theirs. A big Egyptian-American community, a very skillful American ambassador in Ann Patterson, one of our senior diplomats mm -hmm. who everyone believes is a real bridge. So there are things we can do, but we're not the center of the drama. So let's go to your That's questions. Right. Uh, and comments on Mark's presentation. Let's go to your questions and comments. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll just wait for the mic if you would. You've mentioned Obama, and we were in Egypt and traveled around in December 2009. I was struck by the number of young people we met who had all claimed to have been in Cairo for his speech. And I keep going back and wondering whether the excitement that we experienced then, they had literally grabbed onto his words, has had any influence if all of this going forward and if it's maintaining a sense of that optimism among the masses of youth. Thank you. This is President Obama's speech in June 2009. I, 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 I would love nothing more than to be able to say yes, um, but I don't think I can. Um, I, I thought that, that I, was a, I was a big, uh, advocate of that speech, and I'm glad that he gave it. I think it was a very good speech. But what ended up happening was that everybody ended up focusing on one issue, which was the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue. And he raised expectations very high that he was going to engage on that issue and deliver settlement freeze, move towards a two-state uh, peace uh, process and solution. And then he failed. And expectations were raised, crashed, and I think never really recovered. And uh, you saw, by the way, the same thing with what I thought was an excellent speech that the president gave at the State Department in May of 2011. I don't know, were, were you still serving then? I was not. You were not. But so in May of 2011, he gave what I thought was an excellent speech about the Arab Spring and about American strategy. But, and he had one paragraph in there about, you know, boilerplate about restarting the two-state solution along 1967 borders. Yes. That then becomes the only thing which anybody talks about raises expectations, nothing happens, it crashes. And so I, I would say that, um, I would like to say that that was an inspiration for uh, the, the, the revolutions, um, but I, I really don't think that it, that it was. We have a question on the balcony, question on the floor. We have a remote question. Let's go to the first to the balcony. Yes. Do you believe that the United States is contradicting themselves by allowing or wanting the revolutions, but at the same time wanting some monarchies, say, in Saudi Arabia to stay in power so that we may keep our relationship and have that oil? What a great question. Where are you studying? Uh, University of Maine, Orono. The Black Bears. OK, that's great. <laughs> How do you um, know that? <laughs> well, because Admiral Johnson's here, and he tells me about the Black Bear hockey team. Um, but that's a great question, because if you think about President Obama, mm -hmm. he supported revolution in Egypt, in Libya, in Tunisia, he definitely did not support it in Bahrain and wouldn't in Saudi Arabia. Is this a contradiction? Are we uh, being hypocritical? Absolutely. There's no question about it. I mean, I, I actually think that the, the symbolic, uh, I think Bahrain is more important than Saudi Arabia here because in Saudi Arabia, the Saudis were able to kind of crush or buy off their opposition before it really got rolling. But in Bahrain, at the height of Bahrain's protest, you had more than half the country's citizen population in the streets protesting. And so it was a highly mobilized, uh, this was an active revolution, and it was crushed brutally, repressively, in full sight of everyone, and, uh, and, and we did nothing. And I think that, that the, you know, I'm sure, and we had our reasons for doing so, and, uh, and we can talk about those, but the bottom line is that that made us look extremely hypocritical, and I think we paid serious reputational costs for that. The other answer to your question, though, and I think this gets back to something that Marwan uh, was talking about, is that underlying this is, I think, a misconception of what the United States generally means when it talks about promoting democracy. I don't think the US uh, was in favor of real revolutions anywhere, including Egypt, Yemen, uh, Tunisia, anyplace else. Um, I think that they have generally seen 
uh, their preference has been for meaningful political reforms, making more democratic, more stable, more legitimate uh, societies, which wouldn't change their fundamental strategic orientations. So we wanted to see democracy in Egypt because we felt that uh, the Mubarak regime was driving Egypt into a ditch and that it was, no, it was no longer an effective, useful, or helpful ally, and democracy was the way to make Egypt better. But we didn't want to see a revolution, like an Iranian revolution, for example, that would have turned Egypt into an enemy or a fundamental revolution. So reform then, meaningful reform, is a way of preempting that kind of change. And if you think about it that way, then yes, you can support reform in Saudi Arabia, you can support reform in Bahrain without threatening your strategic interests. But I think Marwan's other point is that people see through that now. You used to be able to get away with that dodge, and I think that people now will call you on it. And uh, it's become much harder to maintain that kind of hypocrisy. So Mark, what you're saying is we're balancing competing interests Always. to a certain extent. We want to see reform, but we all, we'll also want to see the free flow of oil to Europe and Asia. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, but, and I, but I think it's, it's important for understanding the kind of systemic and, and, and kind of built-in hypocrisy in American democracy promotion rhetoric, not just Obama's, but throughout 50 years of American uh, diplomacy. Thank you. I think we have, uh, Jim, we have a question from one of our remote locations, from Rockland, from Norman Rapkin. Will the dysfunctional government in Egypt, with the dysfunctional government in Egypt, how do the ordinary people survive, feed themselves, find shelter, et cetera? Is it going to be up to the NGOs to help deliver some aid. Well, Egyptian, uh, poor uh, Egyptians have unfortunately long and deep experience of surviving on the margins. Um, so yes, there's a dysfunctional government now and the economic crisis is intense and you know the, the, the pressures on the pound, the pressures on foreign reserves, those are really new. But uh, you know, for the last 10 years, not a lot longer than that, but I'll just focus on the last 10 years, at the same time that you've seen the GDP growth and uh, you know the the, the uh, neo you know, the liberalization of industries and the like, you had already seen this escalating process of the disappearance of the middle class, rising poverty, collapsing infrastructure, um, the, the, these horrible schools, horrible healthcare. Healthcare is a huge issue in Egypt. Just how horrible uh, the, the the formal healthcare system is. And in a sense, the the impact on ordinary people thus far, I think, has been. Really Real, but on the margins, quantitative, not qualitative. Um, their lives have been terrible economically. The, the struggles have been deep and intense for a long time, and they still are. So there's been no improvement, and the, things have probably gotten a bit worse. But it's not like they were doing well before, and then after the revolution, living conditions have suddenly collapsed. Now, what happens if Egypt actually goes into bankruptcy? Or if the IMF loan, which is necessary to stabilize finances, then leads to massive, in, you know, lift, you know, the removal of subsidies on uh, on cooking oil and uh, fuel and basic foodstuffs, then you have a real paradox, right? Because the macro finances would be put more in order, but you would have a much greater impact on ordinary people than anything which has happened up till this point. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it's been so difficult for the Egyptian government to pull the trigger on. Uh, on that deal. And certainly the, the greater humanitarian crisis is in Syria right now. Oh, yeah. I'm sure Josh will talk about that after the, after the break. We have a question right back here. The, um, the Middle East civilization led the world a long time ago. Uh, and I've never really understood what happened to that. And, and what, is, what does that have to say uh, about uh, the prospect in the future? I think one of the things which is interesting is you don't have to go back 5,000 years. You can go back to, say, 1950, and if you look at the kind of the political, economic, uh, kind of the basic uh, characteristics of Egypt and a number of Middle Eastern states, they were actually not that different from what you would see if you looked at uh, many of the, of the newly independent Asian states, Latin American states. And the really interesting thing is why the Asian tigers took off and the Arab countries didn't, because it's not like Korea and Japan and Taiwan and uh, you know the, the, what became the East Asian tigers um, looked so different from the Arab countries 50 years ago. The, so I wouldn't I wouldn't actually say let's go back and look 5,000 years ago what went wrong. I would say what went wrong after World War II and with, the, with the, the nature of independence. And I would say there, the answer is probably a combination of the Cold War, 
which kind of froze structures into place and allowed authoritarian regimes basically to draw on uh, external money for, and arms for support. And then oil, which had this profoundly distorting effect on economies. Uh, you know, so if you're Singapore, you don't have the luxury of, uh, you know, of deriving massive rents off of exporting oil. You actually have to develop a, a productive, uh, you know, an educated society and a productive uh, 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 economic sector. And I think a lot of the Arab countries just didn't have to do that, and so they didn't. Thank you. We have about a minute and a half for one last question and answer. Uh, 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 an easy question. Uh, there are no easy questions. I I Israel has a, a, a fair amount of importance in, in that area. Is that, are there things that Israel could do that might help this process in Egypt? That's an interesting question. Well. It's an interesting question. I, I think that Marwan's uh, dis description of Israel's deteriorating strategic position is, is accurate. I mean, I think that if I were a security planner in Egypt, I would be hunkering down and extremely worried about what I'm seeing in Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and in Egypt. There's reasons for some reassurance. I think that the behavior of the Egyptian government during the last Gaza war, where they served as an effective broker and mediator uh, to get the ceasefire, should be reassuring at some level. But I think the fundamental problem that Israel faces is that you know, with the, basically there hasn't been a peace process uh, since 2000. And there's been you know, kind of a shift to the right in Egypt, frozen peace process. And I think Israel has really not uh, been able to or really even interested in trying to reach out to Arab or Muslim public opinion. And for a decade, that worked out just fine for them because the dictators of the Arab world were more interested in Iran than they were in the Palestinian issue. They were perfectly willing to cooperate with Israel against Iran, and nobody really cared much about the Palestinian issue or, or anything else at the leadership level. And what the revolutions have done by empowering publics and by you know, making the public matter more is that suddenly Israel is paying, the, is paying a cost which they didn't think they were going to have to pay for not doing that. And so many people will say, you know, if they just solve the Israeli the two-state solution to the peace process, um, everything would be better? No, it wouldn't. And some people say, well, in that case, it wouldn't change anything at all. Well, that's wrong, too. I mean, I think that really engaging seriously on the, on the, the, the Palestinian front isn't going to be a magic elixir. It's not going to solve all the problems. But it would at least, re start, at least possibly start to reverse um, that uh, process of alienation, which I think is at the root of their increasing insecurity. Mark, thank you very, very much for being with us. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your comments about the book. Yes, you're grateful.